Have you ever had the experience where you put a great deal of effort, maybe into your work or your home life or in some kind of hobby, but the return on investment was disproportionate to your effort? You work and you work and you work, but your return is quite small. Or maybe on the flip side, you put a great deal of effort, but you've also been able to realize the fruits of your labor. But somehow the realization of all this wonderful stuff that you hoped for wasn't quite as tasty as you thought it would be. Well, a word that would sum up the scenario, both of these scenarios, is the word unfulfillment. And unfortunately, this is an experience we can all relate with. We want to have work that we're, we're satisfied with, we're fulfilled in. We want to have a home life that we feel fulfilled and we enjoy thoroughly. Go to a hobby. We're trying to burn off a little steam. We have some stress throughout the week. Just want to go to my hobby and find fulfillment. That's not always the case. Maybe, I, maybe actually more often than not, we find unfulfillment. And this, this frustration of finding unfulfillment can ex even be accentuated when we think about the words that our Lord Jesus gave to us. He said, the abundant, fulfilling life I give to you. But if that's the life he actually left for us, and I look around my life and I find unfulfillment, the question is, what gives? Well, as we search for a remedy to this problem, we'll look in perhaps an unlikely source, that being the book of Haggai. So as we look at the book of Haggai this morning, I believe Haggai's contending, I'll make the contention, that the key problem he's saying is that when we pursue our work for our ends, we're going to find unfulfillment. But if we will pursue God's work with our work, we will be fulfilled. So the book of Haggai, it is a short book, so I plan to read it in its entirety. We're told that God's word is inspired. We're also told that we're not supposed to live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So in our quest, to find fulfillment, we will begin by reading God's fulfilling word. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. The Lord of armies says this, These people say, The time has not come for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. The word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai, is it a time for yourselves to live in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now the Lord of armies says this, Think carefully about your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough to be satisfied. You drink, but never have enough to be happy. You put on clothes, but never have enough to get warm. The wage earner puts his wages into a bag with a hole in it. The Lord of armies says this, Think carefully about your ways. Go up into the hills, bring down lumber, Build the house, and I will be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. You expected much, but then it amounted to little. When you brought the harvest to your house, I ruined it. Why? This is the declaration of the Lord of armies. Because my house still lies in ruins, while each of you is busy with his own house. So on your account, the skies have withheld the dew, and the land, is cr land its crops. I have summoned a drought on the fields and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the fresh oil, and whatever the ground yields on man and animal, and all that your hand produces. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the high priest Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and the entire remnant of the people obeyed the Lord their God, and the words of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him. So the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, delivered the Lord's message to the people. I am with you. This is the Lord's declaration. The Lord roused the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, the spirit of the high priest Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people, of armies, their God, and on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. On the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, to the high priest Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and to the remnant of his people. Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Doesn't it seem to you like nothing by comparison? Even so, be strong, Zerubbabel. This is the Lord's declaration. Be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land. This is the Lord's declaration. Work, for I'm with you. The declaration of the Lord of armies. This is the promise I made to you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit is present among you. Don't be afraid. For the Lord of armies says this, once more in a little while, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations so that the treasures of all the nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of armies. 
The silver and the gold belong to me. This is the declaration of the Lord of armies. The final glory of this house will be greater than the first, says the Lord of armies. I'll provide peace in this place. This is the declaration of the Lord of armies. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. This is what the Lord of armies says. Ask the priest for a ruling. If a man is carrying consecrated meat in the fold of his garment and it touches bread, stew, wine, oil, or any other food, does it become holy? The priest answered, no. Then Haggai asked, if someone defiled by contact with a corpse touches any of these, does it become defiled? The priest answered, it becomes defiled. Then Haggai replied, so is this people and so is this nation before me. This is the Lord's declaration. And so is every work of their hands. Even what they offer there is defiled. Now from this day on, think carefully. Before one stone was placed on another in the Lord's temple, what state were you in? When someone came to a grain heap of 20 measures, it only amounted to 10. When one came to the wine press to dip 50 measures from the vat, it only amounted to 20. I struck you, all the work of your hands, with blight, mildew, and hail, but you didn't turn to me. This is the Lord's declaration. From this day on, think carefully. From the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day of the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, think carefully. Is there still seed left in the granary? The vine, the fig, the pomegranate, the olive tree have not yet produced. But this, from this day on, I will bless you. The word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. Speak to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah. I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overturn royal thrones and destroy the power of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow chariots and their riders. Horses and their riders will fall, each by his brother's sword. On that day, this is the declaration of the Lord of armies. I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, my servant. This is the Lord's declaration. I make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you. This is the declaration of the Lord of armies. Amen. And let's pray. Father, I pray for revival in our hearts. Just be able to do your work. I mean, we, we emulate you. You are a working God. You, from the get-go, you had work to do, and it was beautiful. And we can get caught up in our own work, doing our thing, completely forget you, that you have an overarching plan, a theme, a mission, a purpose in life. Please, I beg for revival. I pray that you'd speak through my tongue. If I say anything foolish or if I say anything that is not true, I pray that it be forgotten by all who are listening. May your blessing, just in reading your words, your inspired word, may that be just a blessing that we receive right now to all those hearing. Thank you for your word. We thank you for you. Thank you for your incarnation, Jesus. Please come. May your spirit rest on this word. We need you desperately. In Christ's name, amen. All right. Uh, a little context may be helpful. So with Haggai, we are in the year 520 before Jesus walked in human form. And so the people of God are in Judea which is no small miracle. So some 180 years prior to this, along with about 100 years prior to this, there's two prophecies taking place by Isaiah and Jeremiah. Both prophesied that the people of God would go into exile. And then Jeremiah said, you'll be there 70 years. But Jeremiah and Isaiah said, then after that time, you will be sent back to your land. And then the beauty and the power, you see how God orders the cosmos. There's not been a regime, a kingdom in the history of this world that God is not over because Isaiah says 150 years or more before Judah is released, he says, I will raise up Cyrus, specifically by name, the Persian king, and he will emancipate you so you can go back to your land. Well, sure enough, 539 comes along, Persia invades, takes over Babylon, King Cyrus gives the edict, and he says, people of God, if you want to go back to Judea, may God be with you, go ahead. Well, if that be the case, now we come to, this is the central problem in the book of Haggai. Doesn't take long to get there. Verse 2, Lord of Army says this, These people say the time has not come for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. They're released, emancipated, 539. It is now about 520. Some people say 515. So what's happening is it's been 15 to 20 years that they've been in the land. So basically what it means is if you hadn't done it by now, you're never going to get to God's work. Probably a theme could have been, Lord, we have enough to be getting on with, so sorry, can't get out, can't, we don't have time for you. Or maybe to use a little more modern terminology, you might say something like, my margins are pushed to the extreme. I just don't have any more space. I can't do it. 
So if this be the, the issue, now all of a sudden we're going to begin to see some results of this. Because we'll notice God contends. He said, well, you may not have time to do my work. You've had plenty of time to do your work. He, so, he shows that in verse 3, down in verse uh, 9 as well. He says, you got your own house. You put plenty of time into your own work. You just left me out to dry. And this is an inference. But I would infer, based off the character I see in the rest of Scripture, that the drought, that when they're trying to have food, their lack of, you know, they'd eat, but they're not hungry. They're, they're still hungry. They would drink. They're not satisfied. They're not happy. They have clothing, but they're still cold. I'd say I don't think that actually happened initially. Based on God's character, he gives us time. He said, you can go down your path because as he gave the Canaanites 400 years to repent and then destruction came. Romans 2, 4 says, God is patient with you that you might repent. So my inference, based off the character of God displayed throughout scripture, is that they get back into the land, they get busy with their own work and they just continue to do this. And eventually as the years go by, God finally says, all right, I'm going to, in my grace, pursue you. I'm going to strike you so I can get your attention. Now you work and you don't get a return on investment. Put all this work into it and you get nothing back. So as we read this, we can't actually separate. We see there's a very tangible connection with obedience to God and some kind of a physical blessing. And so for some of you, this may be a recurring theme where I know I need to be more about God's work. I know I need to be more in his word. I know I ought to be taking care of the poor. I know I ought to tithe more on and on and on, but nothing ever changes. In this sense, we can relate a whole lot with these people right here in Haggai. Times may change, but people don't change. We need the grace of God to change us because our bent is to do, I want to pursue my work for my ends, but the end result ends up being, I'm just not fulfilled. And that's what we see with the people here. They're pursuing something in this case, they're investing, they're just not getting a return on investment. But, lest we think if they would have actually gotten the return on investment, they would be fulfilled, you can see other parts of Scripture and then just mankind, man's common experience, that even if we have everything we're looking for, it's unfulfilling. David had everything he could want, but he still needed just one more girl. Solomon had everything he wanted, but let me get a little more wisdom, let me read a few more books, talk about Ecclesiastes, let me have a little more entertainment, maybe a few more women or a lot more women, have all that fruit and it's still unfulfilling. So this is our plight. We're going down a path. We just pursue our own ends until we find we need God to graciously come and intervene. And that's what we see when we get to verses 12 to 15. Really what we're seeing here is a revival. This is the initial stoking of revival. And the central theme, the initiator, the catalyst for this is God's word. We come here, you can go to verse 14. The Lord roused the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Sheotil, governor of Judah, the spirit and the high priest. Joshua, son of Josedach, the spirit of the remnant of the people, they're all stirred up. And why? You go back up to uh, verse 14. It's the Lord's messenger. It's the words, you know, 12, 13, 14, God's word by Haggai. This is why it's so imperative that we hear God's word proclaimed through a sermon, if you're listening to it. God's word through your own Bible study, praying God's word, being around God's people as they talk about God's word, because it's the catalyst that stirs us. It's his actual mercy, his actual grace to us, because we're going to do our own thing. And our end result, we're going to have unfulfillment. This is going to be our common lot in life. And by his grace, he's like, I will actually come to you. A long enough time, 15, 20 years or more, I'm going to send my word via person, proclaim. And look at this grace, they actually respond. So if we're looking at it, God's word is what stirs us. And then now, will we actually respond to God's word? And that's what you see right here, is they respond and they actually start to work, on, do God's work. For the people, if they're, the demonstration of a commitment to prioritize God's work was demonstrated by them working on the temple. That was the demonstration. All of a sudden, now I, I'm putting God first. I want to pursue him. I want to do God's work with my work. Well, this, this uh, scripture right here, just this idea of God's grace to stir us up by his word. Um, it kind of hit me. I have, a, I have a routine. Our family has a routine every day, five to seven, um, with, with the wifey, with the girls. And maybe we'll go on a walk. Maybe we'll do something outside. But usually around, around five, just afterwards, I start cooking dinner. And I like to turn on one of my Pandora playlists. We're going to jam out a little bit, have a little good time while we're cooking, just hopefully teach the girls a little bit of rhythm. And once we, we cook dinner, we eat, and it's bath time. And while we have bath time, we're going to read some books. By bath time, as I'm putting them down, I'm reading books until it's their bedtime at seven. Part of the reading is just for our own enjoyment, but also too, uh, research has shown that if you read a thousand books to your kids by age like four or five, it enhances their brain capacity. 
Now it's these little books, you know, it's like he ran next page to the store, you know, so it's nothing. Well, as opposed to reading the little books, I would say my, my desire was, well, let's read uh, fewer big books. So we, uh, we're currently in the fourth book of the Harry Potter series. We've gone through the Chronicles of Narnia series. Uh, about a year ago, Nurse, uh, Mercy and I, we tackled uh, The Pursuit of God and Guinness, a great biography. So love this routine. We do this on a daily basis. It was about three months ago, by God's grace, I started to see a stirring in my spirit. And it just happens that I'm, I'm a husband and I'm a dad. And so one of the expectations, one of God's work he has for me is to, how am I going to bathe my wife in the word? How am I setting in a, an environment that's directing our family back to God? So I love Drake's God's plan, but it may not always be, always be God's plan for me to listen to his music and my other Pandora list, right? So we're starting to use time when we're cooking, listening to something, turn on a sermon or turn on some worship music. I'm still listening to other playlists, but realize like this is my priority. This is what God calls me to do. This is his work. And then we go upstairs. Not that I'm completely done with the Potter series, but more of a priority. I, I need to push God's kids back to him. Like I realize like these aren't even my kids. I, like these are God's kids. And one thing we're going to find out in just a couple of weeks as we close out this series, we'll see the book of Malachi as he's addressing the priest. And Malachi says, one requirement God has of you, priest, for those of you who are fathers, is that you'd raise up godly offspring. Those are my kids. So feeling the conviction of like, how am I directing God's kids back to him? So while we're sitting there bathing, and then after we're just kind of doing some more reading, let's op open up Jesus' storybook Bible. Or let's open up the biggest story ever told. So I'm directing them back to their maker, to their father. Reading a little kid's catechism to them. You know, question one, who made you? God. Question two, what else did he make? God made all things. So as we've actually done this, it truly has been, this is not cliche, it's like, it's been fulfilling. One, just for my wife and I, because we're connecting at our deepest level, the thing that's going to last forever is our souls. Like there's just something that's drawing us together. And also I find, you go down here, where was it? Uh, verse eight. It says, as you go back to do my work, I will be pleased and I'll be glorified. Actually, I can feel like he's pleased with this. His glory rests on this because I'm doing what I, the work I know he wants me to do. Tell my kids about me. Direct them back to me. So as we're talking about this, we see God's people, they respond to God's word by doing this work. Well, as we respond to God's work, as we respond to God, now we find fulfilling work. Now, as we transition a little bit, we'll, we'll notice from chapter one to chapter two, they start to build the new house uh, or God's temple. They start to do work on this. And then there is a little bit of a observation uh, made by the people that God actually prompts. Because they get done with the temple and he says, there's some of you there who you remember Solomon's temple, all the beauty, the glory of it. And now you're looking at this temple and it doesn't look that nice. It's sort of like you trade in a Mercedes Benz and you got a Datsun back in return. It's like, I'm not, you know, how good is this? And as we look at like, what is, what is this fulfilling work? It's not as though we, we're called to do big and magnificent things as though that gives it the value. The value, the fulfillment that we find is the fact that even in chapter two, he says, I'm with you. I'm gonna, you're going to have fulfillment because you're just doing the work I called you to do. However small it actually may look to you. And as we look at this, he says, you're actually, you're in seed form. You're going to do this work. You're being faithful. One day, I'm going to really beautify this temple. And what a little word for us as we're just kind of passing, you know, just through these verses for us. Like, what if God's stirring our heart and we're responding to it? And we start to see a little bit of work. We're, we're engaging in his work here, but it's almost in seed form. We don't really see it. It looks more like a Datsun maybe than a Mercedes Benz right now. But maybe we're the seeds for what's going to happen in 50, 100, 200 years from now. Because they built this temple. It's going to be 500 years before this thing looks really beautiful and this, this prophecy is actually fulfilled. To just think our response to God's word in a century's time, what if it happens that God brings a sense of revival here to Atlanta? which is packed full of people that they love Jesus. They want to be about his business. And this almost becomes like a missionary hub that around the 6,000 unreached people groups around the world, there's not a people that's not represented from Atlanta that's in those people groups. It's a good word. Not my word, his word, right? So 
just to dream about that. I think it's just little words we kind of pass through here that even if it's a small work, we still find the fulfillment because we're doing what he wants us to do and he's with us in it. The fulfillment's not based on the size of the work, it's based on the obedience to the work. Well, again, as we start to talk about what is this actual work, as I already referenced, it's going to be about 500 years later that King Herod's going to come into power and he had some amazing building projects, built some really magnificent buildings, great architecture. And one of them was the, the, the second temple. And some commentators will tell you that it's in the beauty, it sounds as though it kind of rivaled even the Solomonic temple. So the gold, the silver, the Lord says I'm going to bring in, he fulfills this. But as we look to us, we don't have a temple to build. So what is our work? Like, what is that? That can still be a little bit nebulous. Well, what Scripture tells us, the New Testament, there are some actual temple building references. As we go to 1 Corinthians 6, Paul tells us that don't you know that your vessel, your body, is a temple of the Holy Spirit? And then as we go into 1 Peter, we're told that you guys are living stones. And then when you come together, it's like you're a temple. So this glory that talks about, I will fill this temple, that temple of Herod's time, with glory, that's when Jesus touches down in his incarnation, and he goes, once he entered into those doors, glory finally filled the house. It's a fulfillment of, of Psalm 29 when he says, when you go into my temple, all cry glory. That's what you're supposed to find there. This is a fulfillment. But that was a stationary temple. The temple was meant to represent God's presence. When I went there, I'm close to him. I can offer my thanksgiving offerings to him. I can offer my sacrifices for and on sin so I can be in right relationship with him. Well, now as we get into the New Testament, it's like things have changed. Now we have a mobile temple. The glory that entered that temple now is actually, has entered every believer who says Jesus is Lord now. And now we actually move around and we're taking that work with us. So again, what is this work? I'm just going to take a few examples from the early church. So historians will tell you, if you look at the years 50 to 200, there was no church building like this. There's not like a central location everybody's going to come to to congregate. Nothing like that. But yet, the church exploded. And historians will tell you, said the only way that was possible, the reason that actually happened is because everyday Christians, lay Christians, they took ownership of God's work. They say you saw businessmen and merchants saying that I'm going to take God's work as my work. So they're building relationships with the people that they, they work with and seeing those as bridges to share the gospel with. And that's something that even for right now, I heard a story of one of our members that some years ago, four or five years ago now, was interacting with a colleague and I just want to be intentional Christians to so start talking about Jesus. The guy's like, hey, I appreciate that, but you know, not really interested. So the years goes, go by and he's, you know, this believer, he's just, Trying to love God, be faithful, work hard at his job, make sure he's above reproach, you know, he's not doing anything kind of seedy. And just recently, this colleague, because they've been in a relationship and, you know, they'll talk and just about everyday things, this guy has had some hard times fall on him and now he's turned into this believer. All right, can you tell me a little bit more about this Jesus? Everyday work, that's the work of the Lord, is that this, this believer wasn't pursuing his work for his ends, he was actually pursuing God's work with his work. It's like, this, uh, this is the job I'm at, and now how can I do God's work within it to actually introduce people? That is fulfilling. When you talk to him, it's like, man, it was, it was amazing. I, th I thought it was all right in the past. I thought it was like, well, that's not going anywhere years later. Or you see some of the other early believers, how they're just kind of everyday life intersecting things. They go to the laundromat, they're going to meet people, we're going to talk about Jesus. Well, for some of us, that could be, you like to run. Maybe that's, that's your hobby, that's your everyday life. And nothing wrong with just kind of running outside and just especially right now is beautiful. Talk with the show. he talks about, I just love running outside. And it's like, man, it's like worship. One, that's doing God's work. It's just giving him praise. Look at his artistry and say, you did this. Praise you. That's, that's God's work. That please you. You will find fulfillment when you just praise him for what he's actually done. But along with actually just running to maybe find a little relief and make sure you stay in shape. Possibilities. Can you join a running club? Can you join a group of people where you can... It's just, it's work you're going to be doing anyway, but now I want to do it with God, like intentionality. I want to make God's work, do God's work with my work. I'm going to run, try to build some relationships, and we'll see where this can go, because I want to, God's work is to bring people closer to Him. And so whatever avenue I have, work or everyday life, or, you know, my, my home life, how can I use it? And, you know, a last example from the early church is they talked about hospitality. They used their home 
to build relationships, create a kind of shalom, peaceful environment so people could come in. Can't we have some members that, you know, years back, they just doing some yard work, get to know their neighbors, invite their neighbors over for a meal. They pray over that meal in Jesus' name. The neighbors think that's a little bit odd. Oh, well. So for the next couple of years, there's no real talk about Jesus other than the fact that these members, they just, you know, hey, we're going to Sunday service. You know, we have our city group coming over, just intentional. But they're doing yard work together. Hey, do you need something? Let me come over, cut your tree down. Let me help you out. Just intentional interactions. And years go by. This, again, another neighbor, he has a little bit of a crisis, comes to these believers. And then this past year, in, in the time of COVID, these neighbors say, can we come to one of your backyard services? And so they were just doing God's work with their work. I'm going to work in my yard anyway. I'm going to walk around my, neighbor, my neighborhood anyway. Can I just pray as I'm on a walk? Pray for these people? Can I pray for interactions? Can I just be, you know, offer somebody some, hey, do you want to come have dinner with me? And just do it with intentionality. And as we do this, we begin, we begin to find a great sense of fulfillment. Further, it, all, it begins to even put, like these kind of works, we start to do this corporately, it just puts it on display where it's God's glory and His pleasure falls upon it. There's an episode from around like the 4th century where there was a, uh, the Roman Emperor Julian. He was lamenting how he said uh, atheism, by which he meant Christianity. He said, I look out there, there's not a Jewish beggar around. He said, they take care of their dead and they take care of the other people's dead. They, you know, burying people. There's not a, the godless Galileans, he would say. It's like not one of them once. They're doing such a good job there. But we, the state, we're not taking care of our own people. He felt ashamed. Now, he couldn't appreciate the beauty that this is the glory of God within people doing the work of God. But nevertheless, he saw something happening that he thought, by man's efforts, our pursuits for our ends, we ought to be able to do. But he was finding unfulfillment. So the fulfillment that we feel, it's like it's actually put on display to the world around us. And if I could, I would actually contend that this is the fulfillment that you're looking for. The kind of, when we partner with the Lord, we do His work with our work. It is such a solid, true fulfillment. That not only in the church of yesteryear, in the early church, this happens in the church right now, anywhere the church is on the margins, that no matter what your status is, whether you're rich or you're poor, if you, when you're making God's work, your work, there's such a fulfillment that if society turns against you, and they begin to take away some of your goods. Maybe your reputation is no longer in high esteem because of your beliefs. Maybe you are denied a promotion because of your beliefs. Maybe you lose your job because of it. Maybe they begin to take away your property. Maybe they throw you in jail or worse, like they did in the early church or, again, around the church globally. The sheer fact that these people, historically and even present day, don't just say, okay, let me make a power grab for, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll step back my face so I can hold on to my possessions, so I can hold on to my reputation. The sheer fact that they stand is unbelievable, undeniable evidence of the fulfillment they found in just partnering with their Lord. His pleasure upon them in doing His work is so fulfilling. Don't you want that? Man, I pray for like the grace of God in my life that if it comes to that, we're in our society where we lose our reputation because of our beliefs. We... We're denied certain jobs, or maybe our property is taken away in our idol of materialism. I can feel it in my own life is taken away that I find such fulfillment with God. I say, man, I, this, you can take that. I found such fulfillment because I'm, I'm doing his work. It's, he's with me. This is what we're looking for. This is what's offered to us. This is what was offered to the people in, the, in Haggai's time. And this is the timeless truth that's offered for us. And I'd say, we may not be building, I can't guarantee, what's the work of God going to look like? In a sense, like, is it going to be something magnificent that we see in our lifetime? I don't know. It may not be able to be seen as some beautiful temple, gold and silver in our lifetime. But here's something that is a guarantee. Here's a truthful fact. Is that when we dedicate ourselves to the Lord, not only will we find, his, you know, we dedicate our, ourselves to His work, not only will we find fulfillment this side of heaven, we're going to see a masterpiece on our other end. That we're going to be blown away. It'll be unbelievable, unspeakable fulfillment because we're going to say, look at the beauty of that work that we got to be a part of. This was offered out to us. May the grace of God through His Word stir our hearts. May we respond to His Word in such a way that we're now able to engage in this fulfilling work. Amen. 
Thanks for worshiping with us. For more information about Blueprint Church, visit us online at blueprintchurch.org. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Blueprint Church. Have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday.